Hello, everyone. It's very good to see you all. Uh, thanks for taking care of Josh in my absence last week. Uh, before I take your questions, uh, I want to say a couple of things. One, uh, and perhaps most importantly, I apologize for uh, keeping you here uh, to miss the opening pitches of the uh, Red Sox versus Yankees game and the Marlins uh, at the Nats uh, Nationals here. I, I for one, uh, wish I were at the stadium because uh, it's going to be a very exciting season, I think, for uh, Nationals and Red Sox fans, of which I am one. So uh, I'd also like to uh, say something about uh, the fact that this morning the Senate Judiciary Committee announced its hearing for our D.C. Circuit Court nominee, Sri Srinivasan. As you know, Sri is the principal deputy solicitor general. But you may not know that Sri was born in India and raised in Lawrence, Kansas, eventually becoming an all-star point guard at Lawrence High School. And of course, he is still recovering today uh, from the loss by his beloved Kansas Jayhawks over the weekend. Sri is, of course, also a highly respected appellate advocate who has spent a distinguished career litigating before the U.S. Supreme Court and the U.S. Courts of Appeals both in private practice and on behalf of the United States for both Democratic and Republican administrations. He has argued before the Supreme Court 24 times, drafted briefs in several dozen additional cases, and has also served as lead counsel in numerous cases before the federal and state appellate courts. As a testament to how highly regarded he is by members of both parties, 12 former officials from the Solic Solicitor General's office, six of them Democrats, six of them Republicans, all announced their support for Shri today. The signatories of the letter, uh, including Paul Clement, Ted Olson, Ken Starr, and Walter Dellinger, write, quote, Shri has a first-rate intellect, an open-minded approach to the law, a strong work ethic, and an unimpeachable character. Shri is one of the best appellate lawyers in the country. The D.C. Circuit, as you know, is often considered the nation's second highest court, but it has twice as many vacancies as any other court of appeals and its workload has increased by over 20 percent since 2005. Shri's confirmation will be an important first step to filling this court's four vacancies, and he will be, when confirmed, the first South Asian Circuit Court judge in history. We also urge the Senate to move swiftly to confirm the 15 additional judicial nominees waiting for votes. Of those 15, 13 were approved out of Judiciary Committee, out of the Judiciary Committee unanimously, not a single Republican dissent and four would fill judicial emergencies. Six are represented, uh, represented by Republican home state senators who support their nominations. Now, as I mentioned the last time I gave an update on our judicial nominees, we have seen some progress lately, and we are grateful for that. Since the beginning of the year, the Senate has confirmed nine judicial nominees, and that is good. But it is worth noting that on average, these nine judges waited 144 days for a floor vote compared to President Bush's nominees, who waited an average of 34 days for a vote at this point in President Bush's presidency. Uh, and it just underscores the seriousness of the situation, the uniqueness of the delay that we face in getting nominees confirmed, the arbitrariness of uh, the delays when you have a situation where so many of them are voted out of committee unanimously and then never given a floor vote. Uh, we urge uh, that the Senate act uh, expeditiously to take up and consider and confirm uh, this particular nomination, uh, but also to move forward on these others. With that, I go to your questions. Yes. Thanks, Jay. Uh, let's start with immigration. We got news over the weekend that business and labor had reached a deal on a guest worker program for low-skilled immigrants. Uh, any reaction to that development? Well, I would say broadly that we are encouraged by the continuing signs of progress that we are seeing in the Senate as the group of eight and the Senate more broadly works on comprehensive immigration reform. We are also encouraged by reports, as you note, uh, of an agreement uh, or progress at least between uh, the Chamber of Commerce and labor uh, on that particular aspect of immigration reform. You know, the President's principles are clear. Uh, we are, uh, again, encouraged by the progress. We note comments by Senators uh, Graham, Schumer, and Flake over the weekend about uh, 
just how far that group has come and how close they are uh, to producing an agreement, and we find that uh, good news. However, we're not there yet, uh, and this process is still underway in the Senate. Legislation has to be written, drafted, and we will evaluate the specific aspects of that legislation when it is produced. And on the path to citizenship, it's looking like the legislation that's going to come out uh, in the Senate uh, is going to have a, a path to citizenship that's quite a long path, 13 years or so, and with an, enough obstacles in it that uh, far fewer than the 11 million uh, illegal immigrants in the country would be eligible for that. Will the President lay down any markers about how clear a path to citizenship he needs to see in legislation for him to be able to support it? The President has said that and has made clear in his blueprint that there has to be an earned path to citizenship and it has to be real. It has to end in uh, citizenship. It also uh, has to require folks getting into the back of the line, as we've said, uh, and it is part of a comprehensive approach to immigration reform that includes uh, strengthening border security, continuing that effort, uh, holding employers accountable and bringing our immigration system into the 21st century. There are four key parts of the President's blueprint. And I think we've seen from the progress being made in the Senate by the so-called Group of Eight uh, that those principles are reflected in the work they've been doing. I'm not going to, again, judge elements of the Senate legislation before it's written, before it's produced, before it's agreed to. And I can't, I'm not going to comment on it, you know, reports about what may or may not be in it uh, since that hasn't happened yet. Well, so then what does is, what is a real path to citizenship mean for him? I mean, would, would 13 years, or 20 years, I and mean, what? Yet I'm not going to speculate about uh, what may or may not be in the bill. It would be counterproductive to speculate and say that this would be unacceptable, this particular random suggestion, and then, of course, find out that it's not in the bill at all. So, uh, and I'm just using that as a general hypothetical, not specific to your question. Uh, so I, I, I'll refrain from making those kinds of uh, assessments from here, I would point you to the blueprint that I think is very clear and has been for some time about what the President believes uh, a clear path to citizenship means uh, and where it fits within comprehensive immigration reform. And um, we've seen a string of disturbing incidents with prosecutors being killed in Texas and the prison chief in Colorado. Uh, is the White House doing anything extraordinary to help with that investigation and have federal prosecutors been informed that they could possibly be targeted as well? Well, the White House is not obviously involved in, the, in an investigation uh, of that nature. I would refer you to the Department of Justice and the FBI for any role they might be playing uh, at this time. I just don't have anything for you on it. Yes, Jeff. Uh, Jay, follow-up on immigration. Are you mm -hmm. concerned or is the White House concerned at all that Senator Rubio's support may be waning? <clears throat> I would point you to comments by three members of the Group of Eight, uh, Senators Graham, Schumer and Flake, who uh, made very positive comments about the progress that the group is making. I think it, it certainly is a fact that legislation hasn't been completed, bill hasn't been produced, uh, so the process continues and is not finished. Uh, but, uh, you know, two Republican senators are on the record saying, uh, and I think I have it here, Senator Graham saying that conceptually, and this is a quote, we have an agreement between business and labor, between ourselves, that has to be drafted. It will be rolled out next week. Uh, yes, I believe it will pass the House because it secures our borders and it controls who gets a job. Uh, that was Senator Graham. You also saw positive statements from Senator Schumer. I am very, very optimistic that we will have an agreement among the eight of us next week. Uh, the, these are all welcome signs. We're not uh, celebrating prematurely. Uh, we await the product. We are engaged at a staff level with those who are working on legislation uh, and uh, continue to uh, hope that it will produce what the President has made clear he believes is essential for uh, fairness, for our middle class, for our economy, uh, and, and that is comprehensive immigration reform. It's obviously a top priority of the President. And Senator Rubio's voice is especially important in this. Right. Well, I, I won't speak for any individual senator, so I would direct your questions to him. Well, the question is if you're concerned about where he stands on Again, I, I, I would just point you to the statements by a number of members of the Group of Eight about the progress they're making, the, how close they are to an agreement. Uh, I would also note that work remains to be done 
in drafting legislation. So I'm not going to get uh, too far ahead of the process. Uh, and I would, you know, in terms of the comments that individual senators make about possible concerns they have, I would direct you to their offices. Apropos concerns on a separate issue, are you concerned about the escalating uh, tensions with North Korea? And does the <coughs> White House believe that the U.S. actions on this are contributing to those tensions in any way? Well, not at all. The United States is committed to maintaining peace and security in the region, as you know. Uh, North Korea should stop its provocative threats and instead concentrate on abiding by its international obligations. In pursuit of nuclear and missile programs, uh, its pursuit, rather, of those programs does not make it more secure, uh, but only increases its isolation and seriously undermines its ability to pursue economic development. I would note that despite the harsh rhetoric we're hearing from Pyongyang, we are not seeing changes to the North Korean military posture, such as large-scale mobilizations and positioning of forces. Now, we take this seriously. I've said that in the past. Uh, and we are vigilant and we are monitoring the Korean situation uh, very diligently. And as you know, we're in close regular contact with our team uh, in Korea. That would be both General Thurman and Ambassador Kim. Uh, both of whom are uh, exceptionally well qualified for the positions they hold, uh, and they are coordinating closely with our South Korean counterparts. Uh, the actions we've taken are prudent, uh, and they include on missile defense to enhance both the homeland and allied security, and other actions like the B-2 and B-52 flights have been important steps to reassure our allies, demonstrate our resolve to the north, and reduce pressure on Seoul to take unilateral action. And we believe this has reduced the chance of miscalculation and provocation. I would also note, and I've said this consistently, as have other officials, that this pattern of bellicose rhetoric is not new. It is familiar. Um, and uh, we take it very seriously. We take prudent measures in response to it. Uh, but it is consistent with past behavior. Dan. Thank you. Uh, so just to follow on that, um, the fact that this has been going on for quite some time, this kind of rhetoric from North Korea, um, and that no assets have been moved around, that you can tell. Um, is, is there then the sense that this is more of Kim Jong-un trying to establish his reputation than it is anything else behind the threat? Well, I would reiterate that we haven't seen uh, action to back up the rhetoric in the sense that uh, we haven't seen you know, significant changes, as I said, in the North in terms of mobilizations or uh, repositioning of forces. Uh, and that is important to note. And what that, what that disconnect between the rhetoric and, and action means, I'll leave to the analysts to judge. Uh, we simply uh, evaluate it and take necessary precautionary measures and make clear to North Korea, together with our allies, that this provocative behavior, provocative rhetoric, uh, only isolates them further, brings them no closer to rejoining the international community of nations. In fact, uh, moves them farther away from that potential and possibility. So we, uh, we take steps necessary to make sure that we can protect ourselves and our allies, and we judge both. We assess the rhetoric, and we, and we look very closely at what uh, is happening on the ground. On immigration, um, does the President consider comprehensive immigration reform a, a legacy item, as one of his former top advisors, David Axelrod, said in the press over the weekend? The President views comprehensive immigration reform as a priority for the nation. It is something that uh, is necessary because it will be good for our economy, it will be good for our businesses, it will be good for uh, the middle class. And it has been a pursuit, obviously, that both Democrats and Republicans have engaged in for some time now, that at various periods uh, has enjoyed bipartisan support, this being one of those periods. And the President is focused on working with Congress to get this very important piece of business done on behalf of the American people and the American economy. That's his priority. Uh, and you'll note that in our approach to this, and we discussed this early on about uh, the reasons behind it, we have made clear that we would like to see 
bipartisan action taken in Congress for legislation to emerge from the Senate, in this case, or in Congress, that's bipartisan, that has the support of both Democrats and Republicans, that's written by both Democrats and Republicans, because that allows for the best opportunity for legislation to become law, uh, legislation that fits the principles the President has put forward. Uh, you know, these kinds of big things always require bipartisan action. You know, there are ups and downs in the makeup of the House and the Senate and the party leadership of each body over the years, but in general it is usually the case that for big things to get done it requires bipartisan effort. And this is one of those instances. So uh, we have, the President is absolutely serious about this. He uh, has made clear that he is encouraged by the progress that's being made in the Senate and wants to see it continue and to produce a result. Uh, but uh, he is absolutely uh, confident that the approach we have taken uh, of having the Senate Group of Eight move forward with bipartisan uh, negotiations and, and hopefully legislation has been the right approach. Are the prosecutor shootings, has the President been uh, briefed at all on it? I, I don't know. I'm, sure, I'm certainly sure he's aware of it. I don't know if he's been specifically briefed on, on that, uh, but I, we'll find out. And one quick thing. I, we, CNN and others have reported that Caroline Kennedy um, will be the President's pick to be Ambassador of Japan. Mm -hmm. um, is, is she, uh, what qualifications does she have <coughs> to uh, put her in a position to deal with some of the tough issues in that region, in particular North Korea? Well, I have no personnel announcements to make, and I have seen no reporting that sources uh, uh, supposed personnel decisions uh, to anyone on the record from the White House to the administration. So uh, I think I'll leave it at that. Ann. Yeah. Thank you, Jay. On Wednesday, why is the President going to a police academy in Denver to talk about gun violence so close to not only a couple miles from the Aurora Theater? Uh, is he trying to, it, does he worry that the, um, the violent incidents not only at Aurora, Colorado, but in Newtown, will fade in importance and urgency to both Congress and state legislatures? Well, I think those of you who were here last week, on Thursday I believe it was, heard the President speak passionately about the need to move forward on uh, legislation that would reduce gun violence, and as well as the entire package of proposals the President announced back in January. Uh, and he had with him family members of victims of gun violence, including from, I believe, Aurora, as well as uh, Virginia Tech and Newtown. And he made that point very clear, that we, uh, it, shame on us if just 100 days after Newtown, uh, the memory of that is not, would not still be vivid enough to compel us to act. Uh, and, and the same holds true for Aurora. Now, the President will travel to the Denver area, uh, as you noted on Wednesday, and he will there continue uh, to ask the American people to join him in calling on Congress to pass these common sense measures. Uh, he will also meet with local law enforcement officials and community leaders to discuss the new measures that, that the state of Colorado has recently put in place, including closing loopholes and the background check system to keep guns out of the hands of criminals and others uh, who should not have access to them. And, uh, you know, I think this is, uh, since that's one piece of what he'll be discussing in, in uh, the Denver area, it's, it's, again, important to note, and I think it's important for your viewers and readers to understand that closing loopholes in the background check system is, uh, as we've noted, something that is supported by over 90 percent of the American people, by over 80 percent of gun owners, by Democrats, Republicans, independents, unaffiliated, completely unpolitical, all types. Americans across the board from every region of the country. And it's also important to note that there is an existing background check system. What needs to be done is uh, action that improves that system, that closes loopholes to an existing system. We're not talking about creating something that doesn't exist yet. We're talking about refining and improving it to ensure that those who should not have weapons cannot obtain them. And the, this is something that the American people overwhelmingly support. Uh, it is something that we believe uh, the Congress should act on. All of these measures should have a vote. 
those families the president was with deserve that the Congress vote on these measures and not hide behind filibusters? Did the president watch the Louisville uh, Duke game yesterday? Did he reach out to Kevin Ware or the uh, I'm not aware of uh, whether he watched that game or not, and I don't have any conversations to, uh, to read out to you. Have you talked Bill. to the president since uh, his uh, basketball experience this morning? <laughs> <laughs> what are you saying? <laughs> I'm asking you if the president has confessed that he feels badly about missing <laughs> shot. Well, I have not uh, spoken to him about that. Um, but, uh, you know, the president doesn't get to practice probably as much as he'd like to. Uh, he's a, he's a, having, having done a few uh, shoot arounds with him, he's, he's, he's a pretty good part, shot. Pretty good shot. Right out there in the back. Yeah, well, these are busy times. So on uh, immigration, is he trying to keep his distance from the Gang of Eight so that it doesn't seem to be influencing him trying to? I wouldn't put it that way. I, I would say that we, as I noted earlier, are engaged at a staff level with those who are drafting legislation. I think the fact that the principles that are evident in the President's blueprint are reflected in the direction being taken by the Group of Eight. Uh, says something about uh, both the consensus that has emerged and the President's leadership on this issue. But it is also the case that we believe, uh, as a matter of strategy, that it should be the best course, and we've said this all along, is not, you know, was not for the President to drop his bill, proposed bill, uh, at the outset, but to let uh, and encourage the Senate to move forward in a bipartisan way to try to craft its own legislation because his interest is in getting this done, uh, getting it done in a way that's ke that keeps uh, true to his principles, uh, principles that are reflected uh, in the efforts underway in, in the Senate, but also uh, in the bipartisan efforts of the past uh, that had the support of President George W. Bush and others, uh, as well as then-Senator Obama. So, you know, we're, we're engaged, uh, we're encouraged by the process, uh, by the progress being made, uh, and we encourage, we urge, rather, the Senate to, to continue to move forward. And, and, and hopefully, you know, the, the, the words of Senators Graham, Flake, and, and Schumer uh, reflect that uh, that progress will continue and we'll see legislation fairly soon. It just looks like he may be hanging back so Republicans don't have a target here. You know, I, I, I wouldn't characterize it that way at all. I think that he's made clear, we've made clear that if the process stalls in Congress, uh, we are prepared to move forward with proposing uh, the President's bill, or, you know, our own legislation, but that the preferred path here is the path that is being taken and traveled along uh, quite quickly, or relatively quickly, and that's uh, the process that we've seen underway in the Senate in particular. Yes, yeah. and then oh, yeah. <coughs> On, on that <clears throat> point, uh, Senator Graham, I believe, over the weekend <clears throat> said that that once the bill is unveiled next week, they're going to need the president's help to get it passed. So, given the kind of observation mm -hmm. of what you, the president's role has been, the preferred letting the, the, the process work its will in the Senate, mm -hmm. um, how do you envision that changing starting next week, assuming the bill is unveiled? Is there can can you sort of describe the differences between the current? whatever the current situation is and what, what you see going forward. Well, I don't want to get ahead of uh, the emergence of legislation. We hope that takes place and, and, uh, assuming it, assuming it does, well, then, again, then, I wouldn't want to assume that, but, but I'll still address your point. And that is to say that the President will continue to be out there uh, urging action on comprehensive immigration reform, making clear what his principles and priorities are. We will continue to work with legislators in the process of both drafting and then uh, pushing for legislation, it, you know, assuming that it or hoping that it keeps with the President's principles. And it is, you know, what, what the process produces is a bill that the President could sign and that could get substantial bipartisan support. Uh, I think that we have chosen a path that makes a lot of sense, which is having uh, <coughs> giving room for the Senate to make progress in a bipartisan way on this legislation, but, but I don't think anybody should be under any illusion that we would not be where we are today 
uh, making the progress that we have made uh, if it weren't for the fact that the President has made clear consistently and very publicly, as well as privately in conversation with rank and file members and leaders in Congress, that this is a top priority for the country. And uh, that, uh, I mean, that's why we've had, that's why his, his blueprint, his views on comprehensive immigration reform, reform have been out there and public uh, for quite some time. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, it, this, is a, this is a cooperative effort, I think, that involves more than one leader, uh, requires bipartisan action in Congress. So but we are very much engaged. Assuming that it's something that he can support, obviously mm -hmm. it would be different if it wouldn't be, but assuming that he fully embraces it and well, it, I, it, again, or, or there's Before we know what it is, let's, let's, let, let, I don't want to get ahead of the process. And, and we're encouraged by what we, you think it's, you think it's a done deal? I, uh, you've been around long enough to know that, that uh, we wouldn't want to make that assumption. But the fact is there has been significant progress and we're encouraged by that. And we will, uh, you know, assess the legislation when it when it emerges, uh, and we we certainly hope that's relatively soon. Ed, yeah, sorry. I want to ask about yesterday's Eastern Mass. The president uh, brought his family over to St. John's, as a lot of Republican and Democratic presidents have. Uh, but was he surprised? Were you surprised that the Reverend uh, Leon decided to get so political and attack leaders of the religious right at one point, saying that they want quote blacks to be back in the back of the bus? It seemed sort of odd for Easter. Were you surprised by that? Well, I wasn't there, and I have not spoken uh, with the President. Uh, I know that he uh, enjoys going to uh, uh, Easter services with his family, uh, and in keeping with uh, a tradition uh, that dates back many presidencies. Uh, he went right across the park here uh, to St. John's uh, and uh, attended those services. The, I, think is, I think it's been noted that uh, Reverend Leon has uh, been, uh, been there for quite some time. He has, uh, I think he gave the invocation at President George W. Bush's second inaugural. Uh, so, I, you know, again, I wasn't there. I'm not, I, I, don't, I, I don't have a characterization to make of his comments. Uh, I, the President was just attending Easter services with his family. He did speak at President Bush's inaugural, also did the benediction at, at President Obama's most recent inaugural and said something about loving my <coughs> neighbor, et cetera. Do, do you think this kind of language, though, changes the tone in a positive way? Well, again, it's, this is, he is not a politician. This is not a senator or a member of Congress or the president. This was uh, a sermon uh, that the, at a, at a church here that's been visited by presidents of both parties for many, many years. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, I just don't, I, don't, I don't have anything more on it for you. I haven't talked to the president about it. Yeah. Jay, um, do you expect the president's deficit reduction plans on chain CPI, Medicare uh, <coughs> beneficiaries uh, might be part of his budget that he releases next week? I won't get ahead of the release of the budget. I, I want to make that uh, a fun and full experience for all of you. <coughs> but. Uh, uh, so I would set that aside. The, the items that you referred to were part of the offer the President made to Speaker Boehner uh, during the fiscal cliff negotiations, the offer that I think was widely viewed accurately as meeting Republicans uh, at least halfway when it, on revenue and uh, spending cuts, including cuts uh, from entitlements <laughs> or savings from entitlement reforms. Uh, and that offer remains on the table, as we've made clear uh, repeatedly since then. So uh, if uh, even prior to uh, the 10th of the month, if, if uh, Congress were to miraculously uh, reconvene and want to take action on that offer, the offer stands. And also, can you, um, can you talk about what you ex hope and expect will come out of the President's uh, dinner with lawmakers uh, next week? <clears throat> The President looks forward to continuing the conversation that uh, he's been having with uh, groups of lawmakers, individual lawmakers, Republicans and Democrats. Uh, this is, would be the second uh, dinner that he's, he will have had with Republican senators. The President asked uh, Senator Isaacson to you know, build a guest list for it, and, and I don't have anything more for you on that.
uh, the President looks forward to continuing this conversation, to seeing if uh, common ground can be found and where it can be found on the pressing issues of the day. And that includes uh, budget and fiscal, fiscal issues. It also includes uh, immigration reform and gun violence uh, legislation. Uh, wh how we need to move forward, as the President spoke about on Friday in Miami, on uh, investing in infrastructure for our economy's future, uh, as well as for its present in terms of job creation. Uh, what we need to do to make ourselves more uh, independent uh, when it comes to our sources of energy. You know, these are all priorities that he's put forward. Uh, and we'll discuss with uh, those uh, the senators who attend at the next dinner. He looks forward to it. Peter. So right now we're in the middle of the public comment phase. Does anybody have a score on Red Sox or Nationals? <laughs> no. Nationals or Nationals. Who did? Yankees 8-0. Second pitch of the season. Yankees 8-0. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. What are you doing? Come on. Don't do that to me. All right. Not that anybody knows. Do you, does anybody know Yankees or Red Sox? Zero, zero. Thank you. Uh, not that, anybody, well, that was an April. That was good. Not that anybody was distracted like from the riveting conversation that is the briefing during a ball game. But <laughs> with, with the public comment phase now underway in terms of the draft of the environmental impact statement as it relates to the Keystone Pipeline, I was trying to get a sense without any specific scheduling announcements when we think we should expect to hear from the president on that. Well, the process, as you know, is run out of the State Department. Uh, the timetable depends on. Uh, that process complete soon. and I would refer you to the State Department for uh, what those next steps are and when that process uh, plays out I don't have it I don't have anything I, I there's nothing I can promise you there's nothing on the president's schedule that uh, relates to that question at this time Understood. Then, given just a couple days ago I guess Saturday the EPA classified a new leak um, that took place in Arkansas with several thousand gallons of crude oil spilling from a ruptured ExxonMobil pipeline in that state, the EPA describing it as a major spill. I'm just curious, uh, the President's thoughts on that and as they relate to considerations right now, even if not immediate, on that topic. I haven't spoken about this incident with the President. We obviously uh, have a system in place uh, where the EPA in this case is the federal on-scene coordinator when you have a spill, an event like this, uh, and they are working with and have been working with state and local officials as well as the responsible party uh, as they respond to this incident. In this case, the responsible party is uh, ExxonMobil. Uh, you know, we obviously take the safety of our many pipelines in this country very seriously, and we have uh, an agency that is de dedicated to the task of making sure that those pipelines operate safely. and in cases like these that uh, and investigations are undertaken and uh, steps taken to uh, both mitigate the damage and uh, hopefully avoid them in the future. Mara. Um, without asking you to comment on any impending personnel announcements, could you talk in a general way of the President's opinions of Caroline Kennedy's talents and abilities? No. <laughs> But it was worth trying. John Christopher. In these challenging and rather precarious times with North Korea, we understand that Kim Jong-un has disconnected the so-called red phone. If the President could speak directly to the leader of North Korea, what would he say to him today? Well, I think the President uh, and the administration judge uh, the rhetoric and actions uh, by the North Korean regime for what they are actions and rhetoric that further isolate the regime, that uh, demonstrate uh, a, repeated, a repeated preference for uh, bellicosity as a, uh, rather than tending to the needs of the North Korean people who suffer greatly under uh, a regime that prioritizes nuclear weapons and missile programs over the welfare of their own people. And, you know, it has been our position, as well as the position of our allies, uh, that North Korea needs to abide by its international obligations. It needs to um, uh, do so in order to end its isolation uh, and to better serve its people. Because uh, these, this kind of rhetoric uh, does not benefit the North Korean people. It does not benefit the North Korean regime. 
and it uh, only isolates them further. Alexis. Jay, the President later this week will be traveling wearing his partisan hat as uh, head of his party to do some fundraising. Can you describe how the President is decided how much he would participate in doing that, especially in the context of a week in which he's going to be trying to build bipartisan support for his agenda, mm -hmm. but going out to try to raise money to defeat Republicans? Well, I think he's going to be raising money to try to elect uh, people who he believes share his agenda and their and his priorities. I think that's consistent with actions taken by past presidents. Uh, I know it is, and uh, that's certainly what he'll be doing. But I think he'll be out there talking about uh, the things that he believes we need to do to move the country forward. And he uh, both welcomes the bipartisan progress we've seen on some issues, like comprehensive immigration reform, uh, and is engaged in conversations with Republican lawmakers as well as Democrats to try to foster more bipartisan cooperation to get the work of the American people done. Uh, and uh, you know, it is simply a fact, as I was saying earlier, that you know, in the in the world we live in now, uh, no midterm election or even presidential year election is going to change the absolute fact that to get important things done, uh, we need bipartisan cooperation. And that, I predict, at great risk, <laughs> will be the case two years from now, just as it is today, regardless of how, you know, who wins what races uh, in 2014. Uh, because that, uh, you know, to do the kinds of things that we're talking about, immigration reform, actions to reduce gun violence, uh, enhancing our energy independence uh, while improving uh, our environment. You know, these are, these are things that almost uh, all require bipartisan cooperation, and, that, and that's what the President's focused on. Right, the sequestration impact in the executive office of the President. Can you give us some data? <laughs> <laughs> Let me see what I have for you here. Uh, as the, you know, the White House is one of 11 components of the Executive Office of the President, which is indeed, as we have said, subject to the sequester. Within the Executive Office of the President, several offices have sent furlough notices to their staff, including to 480 uh, employees of the Office of Management and Budget. In addition, EOP leadership has managed our personnel costs in a, way, in a variety of ways, including hiring slowdowns and delayed backfilling of open positions. And as the impact of the sequester uh, progresses, furlough and pay cuts remain possibilities, or additional furloughs as well as pay cuts, remain possibilities for additional White House employees. Um, additionally, in, in order to, to meet the uh, effects of the sequester, many components of the EOP have significantly scaled back equipment purchases and supply purchases, uh, curtailed staff travel, reduced the use of uh, air cards, uh, and they are re reviewing contracts that they have uh, on an ongoing basis to identify opportunities to reduce costs, improve efficiencies uh, without undermining their core mission. Uh, it just means that all, everybody at the White House and the broader EOP uh, is dealing with the consequences uh, both uh, in, it's in many cases in their own personal lives, uh, but in uh, you know, how we work here uh, at the White House, which is true across the federal government because of the impact of the sequester. Because you can be so specific about the OMB impact, and we assume that federal employees get a 30-day notice if they are going to get a furlough notice, and the fact that you're not identifying anybody who's working directly in the White House for the President as being identified for that, is that The clean? OMB works for the President. It's yes. part of the Executive but Office of the President. About, I'm talking about the West Wing, folks who work directly for the President. Those well, folks... Yeah, I just, I, I, I completely take issue with the idea that the OMB doesn't... Okay. Yeah. Hundreds of people who work for the President of the United States, you know what I'm asking you. So my question is, because you haven't identified those people who have received any furlough notices, you're saying that cost-effective shifting of, of dollars and holding down on dollars is, for the time being, going to prevent anybody from being furloughed. That's what you're saying? I, I think I just said that within the Executive Office of the President, a component of that, OMB, there have been 480 employees who have been notified right. of furloughs. OMB. No, but they work for the president, so do I. Yeah. I'm not sure. Uh, 
I, I don't. I don't. Okay. Are those the only the formal White notices? House or there I, I have no other notices to uh, announce to you. I can tell you that, as I just said, as the impact of the sequester progresses, uh, furlough and pay cuts remain possibilities for additional White House employees. I mean, I think you would find at agency after agency, as they make these assessments and, and, and make these budget decisions on a rolling basis, they're having to make decisions about uh, furlough notices and other measures that they have to take. Uh, and that, that is as true here as it is in uh, other federal agencies. Why did OMB give us the number 480 and none of the other components? I'm saying that that's the number I have for EOP and it's uh, 480 at OMB. So the other 10 components, there is no furlough notices at this point? Again, that's what I have for you, Donovan. I, I, I don't have any other furlough notices to announce to you. But there haven't been any? No, I, that's what I have. Not, I'm not, not beyond what I can tell you, that's what I know. See. Previously, at the times of the tension with North Korea, the administration has communicated directly with Pyongyang through various diplomatic channels, uh, including the UN. Has that happened uh, in the recent weeks? Well, we have – obviously, there's been action at the UN with uh, our allies at the Security Council, a resolution that passed uh, unanimously with support from both China and Russia as well as others. Uh, I don't have any specific communications uh, uh, with the North Koreans to convey to you. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that they know what uh, the position is that we hold and, and that our allies hold in terms of both, uh, you know, provocative actions and bellicose rhetoric and what, on the one hand, and then what steps they could take and what they need to do to uh, reduce their isolation uh, and improve the lot uh, of their people. Uh, so I don't, I don't think there's – I think that message is, is – uh, has been fully communicated. Has the White House do you anything about the White House contact with China? Has there been specific communications with the Chinese government over this? Well, I, I can tell you that in general, whenever we have conversations with uh, the Chinese government and our counterparts, depending on which official we're talking about, uh, North Korea is frequently a, a topic. Uh, I don't have a specific conversation to, to provide to you, but that is uh, when, we're, when we're discussing with our Chinese counterparts, you know, areas of national security matters, you know, including North Korea, Korea this comes up frequently. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if that's been the case. Uh, but I don't, maybe State has something more for you, but I don't have anything specific. Yes, sir. Thanks, Jim. Um, given the ratcheting up of the tensions in North Korea, I can ask one more, mm -hmm. although you've hit many of your main points. Does U.S. support <coughs> encompass um, what we understand was a briefing for the South Korean president? Uh, which in, included uh, plans or proposal to launch a preemptive strike against the North should what they call an imminent nuclear or missile attack be detected. Um, does, does U.S. support encompass that kind well, of Well, I'm not aware of such a briefing. Uh, we obviously <clears throat> have a very close relationship with uh, the Republic of Korea and with, uh, with the government there, and we have taken measures that I think I noted uh, were designed uh, to be both reassuring to our allies in the region uh, and to, um, uh, you know, make it clear that unilateral action is not necessary. And we, you know, continue to work with not just uh, the South Koreans but other allies in the region, uh, you know, on this important matter uh, and to uh, make clear what our uh, – the actions we're taking are, uh, what our view is of the – a rhetoric uh, emanating from North Korea, and uh, you know we'll continue to do that uh, as uh, as this goes on. Thanks, sir. Last one. Yeah. North Korea, uh, the, for the change of the North Korea regime or North Korean behavior, will the U.S. and South Korea have any uh, uh, preemptive strike against the North Korea? I think I just answered that, and I don't have anything beyond to say that we have a very close relationship with. Uh, the Republic of Korea, that we um, – I've taken some of the actions, the prudent measures that we've taken, in, both on missile defense and uh, with regards to flights by uh, B-2 and B-52 aircraft, uh, designed to reassure our allies, uh, to demonstrate our resolve to the North, and reduce pressure on Seoul to take unilateral action. Uh, in total, this, we believe, has reduced the chance of miscalculation and provocation. Uh, in this arena. Is just a uh, warning to North Korea all the time, like uh, demonstrated, you know, be bombing to whatever, you know, airplane strikes, 
Why not uh, merely a you know, preemptive strike to the North Korea? Why not? I'm sorry, I don't understand. Why not what? Why not uh, the try to uh, bombing the North Korea? Well, I, I don't think that's a serious question. So I will, uh, I'll leave it at the answer I gave. Thank you.